Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Olive Branch Baptist Church. We're so happy that you're with us on this nice 20-some-odd degree morning. Uh, if, if you are a guest, let us know that you're here by filling out a Connect card in the seat in front of you, or you can scan uh, the QR code on the back of your bulletin that you grabbed on your way in. And also, do not forget to grab your gift bag on your way out the door today. Uh, the youth have hijacked all of the announcements, I think, for this week, except for one. So youth group, you're in good shape. Do not forget, uh, Friday, February 9th, we're doing Winter Jam down in Raleigh. Uh, we're going to leave from the church at 5 o'clock. You can sign up for that at YC this week, or you can go online right now and register a spot on the church bus. Uh, the cost word is $15 cash at the door, uh, and then we'll be eating at the arena, so bring money for that so we're not waiting around here uh, dilly-dallying. Uh, also, two days after that, we'll have a YC Super Bowl party. And I know we got Bills fans, and I see we have Chiefs fans, but as a Ravens fan, you can come on February 11th to watch us win the Super Bowl. Uh, it's all scripted, as though I said at the end of the Packers game. So uh, anyway, so if, uh, there'll be pizza, snacks, and you can watch me either cry or celebrate, or if the Ravens lose next week, it won't matter either way. We'll probably cancel it at that point. Why not? Uh, no, but... Uh, if you're coming to that, if you're interested in coming to that, uh, just let me know so we can have an idea of how much uh, food to order ahead of time. Also, we're doing Impact uh, Mecklenburg Spring Break. We're going to try to get a group of high schoolers together for that. Uh, so just like as we do for the summer Impact, uh, where the cost per YC student is half the full price, we are doing that as well. Uh, so students, your cost for this is only $75, and we need to sign up uh, by March 4th. So if you need more information about that, or if you're wanting to sign up, let me know so I can sign us all up together as a group. And then also, uh, adults or leaders, chaperones, uh, we need uh, some adult help with that as well. And then, of course, if you want more information about that, uh, talk to Lori Wright as well. Uh, Camp Refuel is right around the corner, April 12th to 14th, and the spots for that is running out. Uh, so uh, teenagers, you can sign up for that at... Uh, light the night, the cost is $45, but the deadline is now January 31st, so you have 10-ish days, so make sure that you sign up for that. Um, I don't know what the policy is. If you sign up super late, maybe they let you sleep on one of the trains or something, like on top. Uh, it should be warm by then. We'll, talk, we'll, ask, we'll ask Danny about it. He'll know. Uh, then also, the spiritual uh, renewal weekend of the Walk to Emmaus is coming up. Men, your weekend is May 2nd through the 5th, and then ladies, yours is May 16th through the 19th. Uh, if you have any more, if you have any questions about that, uh, there's information in the bulletin, and then you can also talk to uh, the Hardys, the Ellises, the Bagleys, uh, Curtis, I think even Steve. Uh, there, there are quite a few people who know about this. So if you are interested in that weekend, uh, get in touch with them. And of course, as always, make sure you check out the bulletin and the website and the Facebook for everything else that we've got going on this week. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. All my life, all.
we all going to have a seat for a moment? I want to read Psalm 139 today, because today is Sanctity of Life Sunday. In Psalm 139, David writes, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. God, how precious your thoughts are to me, how vast their sum is. If I counted them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake up, I am still with you. On this Sunday, we remember the Roe versus Wade decision 41 years ago. We also stand for life and also pray for women and unborn children. Since 1973, it's been estimated that there have been over 65 million abortions in the United States. And with good news with the Dobbs decision, the states now get to decide the legality of abortion. But even still, although 14 states have made it illegal, uh, with exceptions, six states went even farther and have made abortion legal all the way up to the moment of giving birth. And so it tells us there's a lot of praying and a lot of standing for life still to do. So I'm going to pray for that and for the continued worship of our God in this service. Father, we come to you this morning very thankful and joyful for the life you give. And we just sang about it, Lord, how you love us and we are filled with joy. Lord, I pray that everyone who is conceived can have that life and have the joy of knowing you. I'm thankful, Lord, we live in a nation who has made a different decision about abortion in our laws, but we continue to pray that each and every state would come to a point where they make abortion illegal. But we also know, Lord, that regardless of laws, uh, choices can be made. And so I pray, Lord, this morning for women who are making a choice right now. I pray, Lord, that they would choose life. And I pray, Lord, for women who have made a choice that they now regret. And I pray that you would give them mercy and love and comfort, uh, for we all are sinners, and all who confess sin receive your forgiveness. I also pray, Lord, for those in our community, like the Salus Center, who are working with mothers and fathers who are in crisis or who are trying to make a decision. And I pray that we would support financially and we would support in volunteering with the Salus Center and other organizations like them who make a stand for life and who are there for <laughs> prayer and support, encouragement and, and financial help for those who are in need. Lord, we pray for a nation one day where all life, from conception to natural death, all life is considered sacred and is protected. And we pray, Lord, for you to change hearts and change minds so that this is what we see and believe and we follow. I thank you, Lord, for the life you give. I thank you more for the eternal life that you give. For, Lord, we all know there will come a day when this life on earth is over. And for those who trust and believe in you, it will just be the entrance into an eternity with you. And I pray, Lord, for all that hear my voice here in the sanctuary and online, that they would know you, Lord Jesus, as Savior and experience life to the full. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me and we'll continue to worship the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. There are so many children here, not just small children, but children in Christ. I need everyone's help. Everyone say, my God is so big. God is so big. And you even did the arms out like Christ did just for you. Let's try it just like him. My God is so big. God is so big. I hear you. So strong and so mighty. So strong and so mighty. Point up to our Lord. There you go. There's nothing my God cannot do. I think we should invite 
every single child, please, we need your help to come up. You can stand in front when it's that time, when it's that time. And let's just wait until maybe like we'll give you one of these because we'll need your help later in the song. But yeah, let's get this party started. My God is all I need. He's all we need. And when it gets to that part, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. We'll definitely need your help for that. All right. You'll come up and then we can just go on back with our families afterwards. Amen. Amen. Don't be shy.
the Lord a hand this morning. So last week we had a lot of fun in here in worship, or at least that's what I heard, okay? But I want y'all to know why, okay? It's because of you and the energy that you bring to the worship of our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so don't y'all go nowhere now. I, you give, you're spoiling me, all right? Because this is week number two in a row. Don't spoil me. But we're going to do th this song we, we taught you guys last week, The Lord is by my side. So now you know it. Not that y'all were holding back last week. I'm just saying. But we're going to do it again today. Um, and I hope you've noticed that we're singing about the strength of God this mm -hmm. morning. Is, there is none like him. Amen. Amen. If he made the universe, he surely got my little problems in his hand. Like, hey, amen? amen? All right, well, let's, let's do it. For the big day, Christmas, and Jesus' birthday, and celebrating that. One of the many thoughts occupied my time when I was sitting in the pew, what kind of gifts would I be getting the next day for Christmas? Much to my behold, I received a book entitled Coach Prime, 
I must admit to you, I did not know who Coach Prime was. But I started reading it, and I realized it's Deion Sanders, who I do know. And I thought it was going to be a book about his accolades in the sports over the years. He's the only person who has won two Super Bowl rings, one World Series rings. He was the top of his game. But back in 1997, here was a guy uh, who had everything. He had one of the things he bragged about back then. He had a different Rolex watch for every day of the week. So let's let him know how wealthy he was. But in 1997, he was in a hospital recovering from a suicide attempt. And during that low point in his life, he prayed. And Jesus entered his life, renewed his faith, brought him back, gave him a new gift. In addition to his God-given football and baseball talents, gave him the gift of ministry of Jesus Christ. And from that point on, Deion Sanders, Coach Prime, has still been coaching he coaches uh, young boys into men, and most importantly, uses football to turn those men into disciples of Jesus Christ. So much accolades to uh, Coach Prime on what he does. Please let us pray. We pray to you today that you may awaken us in the many gifts that you have bestowed upon us, dear God. As Paul said in Romans 12:6. Through your grace, we have different gifts. Some of us have the gifts of prophecy, service, teaching, encouragement, generosity, leadership, and finally the gift of mercy. Many of us have hidden gifts, and we pray to you that you may discover these gifts so we too may share the love of Jesus Christ to others. This may require some of us to step out of our comfort zones and take risks to do something new and different. I pray to you that you give us the strength and wisdom to do this. Finally, I pray, God, that you will open our hearts and minds to, to receive your word through Pastor Wayne's message today, and that our offerings are acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. And as the children are going to Children's Church, I ask you, do you like roller coasters? I love roller coasters. The first roller coaster I rode was at King's Dominion when I was a little kid. Back then, the children's part of the park was called Hanna-Barbera Land. And so the roller coaster was a Scooby-Doo roller coaster. Now it's all Snoopy themed. So now the uh, children ride on Snoopy rides and Woodstock rides, but mine was the Scooby-Doo roller coaster. And since then, I've loved rolling, riding roller coasters. When I was a youth pastor in Ohio, we would go to Cedar Point, which still has some of the tallest and fastest roller coasters in the world. And it was always a joy. When I had my heart problems and a transplant, the doctor said the coaster days are over. And so now I can't ride roller coasters unless I want to uh, be in hazard of my health. But I still love them. As much as some people love them, the excitement of them and the speed of them, our spiritual life sometimes are like roller coasters. Last week I described how our spiritual life is sometimes like a journey down the path through the forest. But it also can be like a roller coaster where we're closer to God at some times and other times we're farther away from Him. And then we get closer to God and then farther away from Him, back and forth. And our lives shouldn't be that way, but yet oftentimes that is the reality. And this morning we're going to look at King Jehoshaphat and that was how his spiritual life was. As we learn from him, we can avoid the ups and downs of our walk with God. We talked about his father last week, Asa. Asa's son Jehoshaphat became king when Asa died at the age of 35 when Jehoshaphat became king. He ruled for 25 years and died at the age of 60. What was unique about him was that he focused on the word of God throughout his reign. It says of Jehoshaphat, Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked by his commands not according to the practices of Israel. So when his reign began, it was filled with peace, and he was able to amass a large army, over one million soldiers. That's hard to imagine this small country of Judah could have had one million soldiers, and it's quite possible they did. It's also possible that it's difficult for us to interpret how the Hebrews at that time wrote numbers, and especially groups of soldiers. So maybe it was actually smaller, but maybe it wasn't. Maybe we are reading them correctly. And this is how large that army had become. 
It's also impressive that the people of Judah were so thankful to live in that nation that they brought tribute to Jehoshaphat. Could you imagine living in the United States and being so glad you lived here that you started giving money to the president or to the government and said, here, take my money. My goodness, we're trying to keep it back because they're trying to steal it all from us. And, but that's how it was. They were trying to give to him the nations around, the Philistines and the Arabs. They were coming and giving tribute and animals for sacrifice because of how prestigious and how great in the eyes of everyone Jehoshaphat was. But what I do like about him was that he was not content that he knew God's word and he followed God's word. He wanted everyone to. He wanted everyone in his nation to know God as well as he did and to follow God as well. And so he had a plan to send his officials and to send priests to go throughout the land of Judah and teach them the word of God. In the third year of his reign, Jehoshaphat sent his officials. And I'm not going to read their names and all morning long. I'm not going to read these long list of difficult names takes too much time, and I can't pronounce them anyway, okay? In the third year of his reign, Jehoshaphat sent his officials to teach in the cities of Judah. The Levites with them were a long list of names, and these were the Levites. But here is the point that he wanted everyone to know the Word of God. Remember then, it wasn't like it is today. Today we have multiple copies of the Word of God. You can probably in your home have 15, 20, 30 copies of the Bible. Back then, no one had a copy of the Word of God. They were few copies. The ones they had, of course, were handwritten copies. And I assume there was one in the temple. Maybe some of the priests had them. But there weren't hundreds and thousands for all the people to have. So the only way someone living in the city of Bethlehem, for example, would know the Word of God is for someone to teach it to them. And so... Jehoshaphat wanted to make sure that his people knew the word of God. See, they taught throughout Judah, having the book of the Lord's instruction with them. They went throughout the towns and taught the people. So what is your commitment to the word of God? We have all those copies sitting in our homes. Do you read it? Do you, more importantly, obey it? It is easy, especially if you're a Christian who has read the Bible many times, to think you already know it. You know, you know the stories in the Bible. You've read the Bible from cover to cover more than one time. You've heard a thousand sermons. You could stand up here and preach it yourself when we get to certain passages in the Scripture. And so maybe you feel, well, I've read it. I know it. I don't need to read it again today. I don't need to read it again tomorrow. But this is what's so important to know about God's Word. It is living. It's not just letters, words on a page. This is the means by which God, the Holy Spirit, speaks to us today, even though it was written thousands of years ago. And so you know this from your experience. You can read even the Christmas story today that you probably could quote to me. But you can read it today And God could say something different to you today than he did five weeks ago at Christmas or that he did 20 years ago at Christmas. Because it's living. It's God speaking. So therefore, we need to read it constantly, every day, so that we know it. And then, as I said, it's not just enough to know it. We must do it. Jehoshaphat had such a commitment to the word of God, he wanted everyone in his nation to know it. Let's have that same commitment ourselves. Well, as we saw with his father, and as you know in your life, and as we even see in the disciples' life, when we are living for God, God gives us a test to see how much we have really learned. Because isn't it easy to follow God when everything is going great? And when everything is going great in our lives, we can sing the songs of praise, and we can say, oh yes, I trust God, I believe God, I'm close to God. And then when a test comes, the true colors come out. And then we really find out how close to God we are. And so it was the same for Jehoshaphat. And so there was, for most of the kings in the Bible, wars. That's how they were tested. 
We don't get tested that way. <laughs> we get tested in other ways. But it doesn't matter what the test is. The lessons are exactly the same. So there was the nation of Aram, which was the nation to the north of Judah and Israel. And they were threatening. So it's a long story in the Second Chronicles chapter 18. And this was the test. Would Jehoshaphat compromise? He was committed to God's word. How committed was he? That is the test. And the same can be said of us. The story is very lengthy. That's why I'm not going to read it to you from the screens. I'll explain it to you, but if you want to follow along and read it later today, it's 2 Chronicles 18. So this is the setting. The king of Israel is Ahab. If you know anything about the Old Testament kings, the most infamous one is Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel, even in our culture, at one time it was more literate of the Bible, <laughs> knew Ahab and Jezebel, and they are the epitome of evil and idol worship. So this is the king that comes to Jehoshaphat and says, help me fight this battle. So this is the test. Is Jehoshaphat, who is a godly king, going to align with a wicked king? As a godly king... Why would he align with a wicked one to be involved in a battle that's not even his? But see, the reason that he does compromise is because he had already compromised before. And this is the problem. We compromise a little bit, and then it leads us to compromise a bigger bit, and then a bigger bit, and then very quickly we are far from God. The compromise he'd already made was that he had married his son to the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Now, maybe he did so to make a political alliance and keep peace, but right there he's got his own son in the most wicked house on the earth. That is a compromise. That actually in the future turns out that his son becomes a wicked king of Judah because of his alliance with Ahab and Jezebel. And so, also, Ahab had this great plan to help himself out, but he wasn't concerned about Jehoshaphat. <laughs> See, Ahab's plan, because of that marriage, wanted to bring those two kingdoms together by having Jehoshaphat killed in battle. That's why he wanted him to join him. So Ahab's plan was for Jehoshaphat to go into the battle all dressed up as the king, I guess with the crown and the robes and everything else, and ride in this chariot into the battle where Ahab was going to disguise himself, and he was going to ride into the battle. So you can already see what the plan is, and why Jehoshaphat walked right into it is amazing and very foolish. Now, Jehoshaphat did at least do this. He said, I want to hear from God before we go into this battle. And he was genuine in that. And so Ahab said, yeah, I've got some prophets. So Ahab brought his prophets, and of course they were all paid by Ahab. And they said, yeah, go, you're going to win the victory. This is going to be a great battle, and you're going to win. And Jehoshaphat could even see right through that and said, no, 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 no. Let's have someone who really talks to God come here and tell us what's going to happen. And so Ahab said, yeah, we do have one prophet like that, but he never says anything good about me. So he's summoned, and at first he gives a sarcastic answer. Yeah, go ahead, have a great time at that battle. You know, you're going to do great. You know, it's very obvious that he wasn't speaking for God. And even Ahab said, tell us what God has told you. And God had said, this is going to be a disaster. And Ahab, you're going to die in the battle. Nevertheless, Jehoshaphat and Ahab go into the battle. And of course, God is right. Even though Ahab had disguised himself, the soldiers, when they saw the Jehoshaphat, were ready to go for him. But God protected Jehoshaphat, and those soldiers went for Ahab. And he shot with an arrow, and he dies later. This was very foolish, of course, for Jehoshaphat, and he returns home, spared by God. But then Jehu, son of the seer Hananiah, who was the seer last week who talked to his father Asa, went out to confront him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Do you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the Lord's wrath is on you. However, some good is found in you, for you have eradicated the Asherah poles from the land and have decided to seek God. Jehoshaphat was one who sought after God, and he was one committed to God's word. 
Yet he had compromised in marrying his son to Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. He had compromised in aligning with King Ahab. And so for this, God rebuked him, although God, in his mercy, didn't kill him. And you remember last week, Asa, when he was confronted by God because of his sin, he got hard-hearted and he refused to repent. And he even died far from God. He did not finish well, as we said last week. Yet this is the wonderful thing about Jehoshaphat. He had been close to God. Now he was far from God. How does he get back to being close to God? He repents and seeks after God and recommits himself to God's word. And so then he learns the lesson and we learn the lesson not to compromise. How are you compromising in your life? And also a lesson from the scripture is how close are you to those who are not like you in your faith? This is a a tricky one. It's not tricky, I should say. It just takes wisdom to understand the balance. We are called as Christians to go to people who are unbelievers and tell them about Jesus. That means we're going to be in the world. We are going to have friends who aren't believers. And we are to have love for them and tell them about Jesus and what he's done for us. Yet our closest relationships cannot be with unbelievers. Because those closest relationships, if they are, will bring us down. You've seen it in observation here in the scripture as an example. The closest relationship we usually have is with our spouse. And I've seen it over and over again. A believing spouse, an unbelieving spouse. You would think the believing spouse would bring the unbelieving one to faith. And that does happen sometimes. But what more usually happens is the believing spouse makes compromise after compromise to keep the unbelieving spouse happy. And in doing so, the believing one's farther from God, and the unbelieving one's no closer to God. That doesn't happen all the time, but it's a warning from the Apostle Paul not to be unequally yoked. So I challenge you right now to think about your relationships. Usually... We become like the people that we hang out with. And so if our closest relationships are those people who don't value God and don't value relationship with him, that's how we're usually going to end up eventually. Whereas if our closest relationships are people who are believers and share our values, we will strengthen each other and we'll be closer to God. Think about that as we continue with Jehoshaphat's life. He repented and became even more committed to God's word. Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem and once again he went out among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim and brought them back to the Lord, the God of their ancestors. So now he had set up these priests who went to the towns to tell people about the word of God. Now he sets up these courts to make sure that the word of God is applied and that people are obeying the word of God and if they're not, then they are judged in court And therefore, there is justice and peace in his nation. And so it says, Note that Amariah, the chief priest, is over you in all matters related to the Lord, and Zebediah, son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, in all matters related to the king. And the Levites are officers in your presence. Be strong. May the Lord be with those who do what is good. So again, he compromised He failed, but then he repented, and he sought the Lord, and he brought everyone else with him in that repentance and bringing justice to the land. And so even if you're close to God and then you're far from God, repentance and seeking him again and committing to God's word will bring you back up close to him again. So this is the wonderful news of Scripture. God often gives second chances, third chances, 20 chances, 50 chances to those who are repentant. But there is a warning. As you read scripture, some people got one chance. So we can never take God's grace for granted, never take for granted that God is going to give us a hundredth chance. But if you have sinned and you still are breathing, that means you have an opportunity for another chance. And that is the wonderful truth this morning If you will accept it and you feel far from God, you can leave here close to him. 
Well, another test came. <laughs> because remember, he was close, and then he wasn't, and now he's close to God. Well, let's see how close he really is to God, okay? And so again, another war. And this war, it says that he was afraid. Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he resolved to seek the Lord. Then he proclaimed a fast for all Judah who gathered to seek the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek him. So notice, he's afraid. There's a war, and he doesn't know what to do. He does the only right thing. He prays. He could have tried to make his army a million and one. He could try to make it bigger. He could have tried to make an alliance with some other kings. He could have done all the things that all the other kings would usually try to do if they were being threatened. More armor, more money, more alliances, but he did the only thing that anyone should do when they are afraid and they don't know what to do. He prayed. And notice he got everyone else to pray with him. The whole nation praying and seeking God. And then God spoke. All Judah was standing before the Lord with their dependents, their wives and their children. In the middle of the congregation, the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehazel, and then there's his family tree, <laughs> and he said, Listen carefully, all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast number, for the battle is not yours, but God's. God told them, I am going to win the battle for you. So they prayed, and then they heard God speak. And this is the important thing, they believed what God said. Now notice what they did in belief, they acted on that belief. In the morning they got up early and went out to the wilderness of Tekoa. As they were about to go out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. Throughout his life, he was committed to God's word. And here's an example. God's word was, I'm going to fight this battle for you and give it to you. Was he going to believe it? He said, yes, I believe you, God. And he wanted everyone else to believe as well. And now he acts on it. Because again, he could have said, yes, I believe you, God. And then he got his army and made it bigger. And then he could have made an alliance with another army. You see, we do that too. We read the scripture and we say, yes, I believe it. But then our actions show the exact opposite. We start doing everything else rather than actually believing what we read. But Jehoshaphat didn't do that. He actually believed it. And he showed that he believed it by actually not having his army march first, but having the choir March 1st. Then he consulted with the people and appointed some to sing for the Lord and some to praise the splendor of his holiness. When they went out in front of the armed forces, they kept singing, Give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever. Think about this. The army is marching, but the first group that's going to meet the other army are the people singing, the choir. Give thanks to God. Give thanks to God for his faithful love endures forever. Doesn't that show that he believed what God said? <laughs> because he's not even sending any arrows or any soldiers or any swords to the front. He's just people praising God for the victory they already have before they even get there. That shows the faith he had in God's word. It showed that he believed God's word. And that's the type of faith we should have when we read the Word of God and actually act on what we believe. And so notice in this test, he passed it with flying colors. Because he was committed to God's Word and he sought after God, when he was afraid, he prayed. When he got an answer from God, he believed. And he praised God for that answer. And he went out and showed an action that he actually believed what the Lord said. Now, can you believe this? He compromised again after that great victory. <laughs> you were just starting to get to like this guy, weren't you? I mean, he was, he was really awesome. But the last words that are spoken about him 
was that he had a scheme to get even wealthier. And he aligned again, of course not with Ahab, Ahab was dead, but Ahab's son, Ahaziah. And so they had this scheme to build these ships. Then I guess they were going to get into the import-export business. And they were going to take these ships up to Tarshish and get goods there and bring them down to Judah and back and forth. And, and King Ahaziah was going to get rich. King Jehoshaphat was going to get richer. And they were going to be famous for their world trade. Well, God wasn't too impressed. And in fact, God sent a prophet to Jehoshaphat to say this. Because you formed an alliance with Ahaziah, the Lord has broken up what you have made. So the ships were wrecked and were not able to go to Tarshish. <laughs> Maybe a storm came and they're sitting nice in the harbor and after the storm, there's not a single ship on the surface. They're all at the bottom of the sea. All because, again, he wanted to align with someone who was wicked he wanted to compromise his belief in God's word. God promises us, I am with you. I will never leave you. And do you know those, that promise is made to us in the context of money? I mean, we use it in all contexts, which is true. But its context in the Bible is that God is watching over us and he will take care of our needs because he's always with us and he will never leave us or forsake us. And so if he had believed that, he wouldn't have tried to get even wealthier. My goodness, he had so much wealth anyway. I don't know why he needed this business too. But the important thing wasn't that he was trying to get more money. It was that he, was, again, was aligned with an evil and wicked king. So our life with God often is an up and a down. But it doesn't have to be that way. From the good times in Jehoshaphat's life, we learned that a commitment to God's word, praying to God, believing God, and obeying his word will lead to blessing and will lead us close to God. When we get into trouble is when we compromise what we know and what we believe. And we compromise a little and a little bit more and a little bit more. But also hear this comforting news. If you have compromised to the last extent, if you have walked as far away from God as you can get this morning in repentance and seeking him and his word again, you can be close to him as you were before. So think about those truths as we respond now to God's message. Father, we are thankful for the example of Jehoshaphat. Thankful, Lord, for the God that you are. I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning who are far from you. I pray right now is their moment to come back to you. I pray for my brothers and sisters now who are being tempted to compromise. I pray, Lord, they'd be steadfast and stay close to you. I pray, Lord, for those, my brothers and sisters, who have just given up on the word of God. Not that they don't believe it, but it's become stale or it has become a routine. I pray, Lord, each and every one of us would recommit ourselves to daily reading your word and listening to you and praying to you. Father, I'm excited about what you do in our lives and what you will do in the life of this church if each and every one of us was committed to seeking you, your word, and prayer and scripture reading. Lord, I know that you would do great and amazing things in our midst. Do so now, Lord, as we say yes to you, and we pray Jesus in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. A song of response. I'll be with you here to pray with you if you have any need. Let's say yes to God at this moment.
sing it out, church. You rose from death. these past two weeks next week of doing worship. So let's pray together and then y'all are dismissed. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, we do recognize that uh, there is a path that we have to walk that is good in your eyes, that we're not uh, to compromise on on what you have placed before us in your word. I pray that uh, as we leave here today, we are uh, standing on the side of truth, that we're not uh, going after the things that may uh, be beneficial uh, just to us, but may be uh, beneficial of an eternal uh, worth. And so uh, I pray that you would bless us as we go out this week and bring us back safely on Sundays. In Jesus' name, amen.